Thank you. So, as Richard mentioned, we're going to start with fiber, basically the transmission medium that we are all using, and that's propagating the information we want to convey. What I want to do here is rapidly browse the evolution of optical fiber, what happened during the last couple of years, and especially starting with what is the potential of optical fiber. So when we look at here, this is basically what I tried to make as a yeah, simplified representation of the spectrum. What is the spectrum? Basically, this is the amount of potential bandwidth you have available in your transmission medium. When you look at it, um, here, okay, visible light, this is basically a spectrum ranging between 380 and 780. Uh, more interesting is here, the mobile guys are using air spectrum, the spectrum that is available here, subject to many, many regulations. And overall, it's a total bandwidth of two gigahertz that they have to play with. They are not using it all. They are using fractions of band uh, between upstream, downstream, several different bands that are pretty well standardized. And for instance, when you lo we look at uh, LTE, the 4G um, uh, telecom gen uh, mobile generation, you see that they are using slots of 20 megahertz of bandwidth. And out of these slots, they are available to make a lot of information transport using very sophisticated modulation formats. What I'm aiming at saying here is that for optical fiber, it's not in two gigahertz that we are playing. We have a potential here of 60 terahertz, which means 60, 10 to the, to the power 12. It's an enormous amount of bandwidth that we can leverage and that we put in the ground, that we put in the air, I mean, in aerial deployment. And this bandwidth, basically, usually you have um, the, the representation of this is usually the other way around because we, we put it in nanometers. Here I put it in, uh, in hertz, so it's reverted. But basically you have the original band, which is kind of ranging between 1260 and here uh, 1360. Original band, extended band, short band, classical band, long band, and ultra long band. So all those bands offer potential spectrum and we really have, as fiber makers, cable makers, uh, to secure as much as possible all this bandwidth for the system guys to be able to leverage any slice of hertz and convert that into bandwidth. How do they do this? Here, some examples. Uh, basically, what you take, you have some bandwidth available, and then you, put, you apply a modulation and you convert these hertz into bit per second. Typical orders of magnitude for metropolitan WDM system. Um, typical systems are transmitting 10 gigabit per second channels. NRZ means non-return to zero. It's basically one, zero, one, zero, depending on what you want to transmit. 200 gigahertz channel spacing, so you can cascade many channels, and then means that any slice of hertz, you can leverage this to make 0 0.05 bit per second. So you convert one hertz of spectrum in 0 0.05 bit per second. More sophisticated modulation formats, like uh, now, um, you have what they call quadrature phase shift keying. So it means you don't modulate any more uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, the, uh, the amplitude alone. You also modulate um, uh, the phase. And you're using more levels in order to pack more information in the available spectrum. And typically, the 100 gigabit per second systems that the transmission system guys are now, uh, are now able to put on the market are using this sophisticated modulation format. So they can transmit 100 gig uh, channels 50 gigahertz spaced, which is basically denser, which converts into two bit per second per hertz. But again, this is the optical transmission. There's still a way to go. The mobile guys, uh, when you're using a 4G phone, they're using LTE modulation format that are way more sophisticated, using 
symbols of 8 bits. So here this is, for instance, a 16 QAM using symbols of 4 bits. But LTE is using 64 QAM, so even, even more, using 8 bits of symbols, which really enables them to uh, make out of 1 hertz 4 bits per second. And even the top of the top of LTE using multiple input, multiple output, they're able to make 16.3 bits per second per hertz. So just to give you orders of magnitude, a typical metro system is here and uh, the, the latest generations of uh, LTE radio system here. So again, for radio, spectrum is scar uh, scarce. I mean, they're, they're running out of spectrum. They need to be very powerful in the way they use it. And for optical transmission, it's going to come year after year that the progresses made in mobile are also adapted in uh, optical environment. So the spectrum usage will be more and more effective. But more and more effective means we need to do something to secure that all those bands can be used by transmission systems. Because typical lifetime of a transmission system is five years, maybe maximum 10 years, because new generations are always entering into the play. Systems are evolving. But when you lay your fiber, this is not for five years. The fiber is going to be there to stay. So you need to be sure that what you lay in the ground is going to be durable and can withstand all those generations by opening up everything. Just a, a chart I, I've borrowed uh, to the Bell Lab guys showing the evolution of, uh, over the years, evolution of the capacity of transmission systems. So initially, it used to be very short distances, multimode fibers in the 80s. Then uh, appeared the single mode, then the Erbium amplifiers that really enabled to transmit multiple channels and, and don't convert them regularly to electronics, just remain optics all over the play uh, until the, the, the end of the transmission, and now those latest generation systems. So again, bandwidth is, is, is available. It's all about how you can use it. And how you can use it, there are some limits to it. When you, the more sophisticated you are in terms of modulation format, and typically latest top of the top, I mean, they are now talking about 400 gigabit per second on one channel. And then WDM, they can cascade many channels of, of, of this type. So 40, 100, five, 400 um, gigabit per second. There is a theorem called the Shannon theorem, which basically links the capacity, the, the bandwidth you can make out of a channel depending on the, sign, on the noise you have, signal to noise ratio. So for such extremely sophisticated modulation formats, you need highest quality optical fibers to contain the noise and really have the best possible transmission performance. To give you an example, in passive optical networks, uh, I'm using here uh, some graphics from uh, the ITU uh, the ITU about the um, different generation of PONS. PONS is passive optical networks. Huh? These are the, the active equipment that are used in the access for fiber to the home. Current generation of PONS are using for the upstream here a band between 1290 and 13, uh, 1330. And for the downstream, means from the uh, central office to the end user, to the uh, premises, um, uh, 1480. To 1500. But basically, when you migrate to a new generation, and they are talking about 10 gigabit pawns now instead of one gigabit capable pawns, you need to find slots that are unused because the current generation will coexist with the new generation. So you, you, you need to find empty slots so to avoid the channels to collide. And these empty slots. OK, they are on the, I would say, extreme down of the original bandwidth or the higher part, the upper part of the long band. So means that new channels are incorporated in those bands. Then those higher bands that were used uh, initially for monitoring perspective, now the monitoring channels need to go even beyond. So really, you need to, to, to open up all these bands. And also because we're always uh, cost constrained, 
means that the active, uh, the, the, tr the transmission power that is possible for a laser and the receiving power, they are limited also. When you want to use off-the-shelf components, you need to contain cost and, and you have some limitations. So the limitations of the overall budget between the central office and the premise are typically set by the grade of optics you are using, the different type of the class of pawn, class B, class B plus, class C. But when you look at uh, a passive optical network, a lot of the bandwidth, uh, sorry, of the dBs or the budget is already consumed by the splitter, you know? this device that takes one fiber and split <coughs> the signals into many fibers. So you see out of potential 30 dBs, you, always, you already remove between 14 and 22 dBs just to split the signal between one fiber and many fibers. So nothing's much is left here for the fiber. I mean, when I mean the fiber, I mean fiber itself, cable, connectivity, uh, splices, everything related to, to handling the, the passive layer. Not so many dBs are left, so the system can work properly. And there is an area here, in the, especially in the higher part, that is more sensitive uh, to potential event, potential stresses on the fiber. Those long and ultra long bands, there is an, eff an effect here called uh, microbanding. And this effect can cause, well, this is magnified here. In practice, this is not going that high. But just for you to understand, I've, I've really magnified the effect. So in these regions, you need to do something on the fiber. So in, in, instead of having that kind of high loss, you contain the loss to the reasonable, uh, reasonable level. So how can we optimize a fiber? First, how do we produce a fiber? Fiber, basically, the transmission element is glass, but, but real glass. I don't know if you've ever visited a production facility for fiber. This is really handling glass. Um, we start, there are different ways of making the glass. Of course, this is not the glass of a window. Huh? This is a very, I mean, high purity glass with uh, very, very, very little pollution inside, because if not, any, any piece of pollution will, will, will kill the attenuation. So it's extremely precise and fine glass. So either we start with a tube, and then inside the tube, we deposit layers of glass that will be the core and the cladding. Or we have another way. We start with a, a rod, a cane, and we just grow the different layers of glass outside. So this is either outside deposition or inside deposition. Then there are different ways of making those two things. The beauty of Prismian, uh, we've been consolidating all the technologies that are available just after many, many acquisitions. And now inside the company, we have access to all the ways of making glass. So really, we can, we, can, we can take one or another one, depending on the fiber we want to make. We, we really have flexibility to select whatever we want as a production process. And in the end, what you get is really uh, a rod of glass, of pure glass, which is uh, pretty heavy, because uh, this is called the preform. And then this is going to be capable of typically between 1,000, 2,000 kilometers of fiber with one big preform, you can draw between one and 2,000 kilometers of fiber. And then this fiber, glass, the core, the cladding, will be protected but what we, by what we call a coating, really, some layers. The duty of, the la of those layers will be to protect the glass against external word, external stress. So we put this preform on top of a drawing tower here, which is basically an oven, uh, 25 meters high, typically here. And the glass just melts and melts into a fiber. And the fiber is then drawn here and wrapped. And you have your, your fiber read, ready to be used. And on the path here, you deposit this famous coating. Once here, the, the, the temperature here is pretty high above uh, close to 1,200 degrees Celsius, then the temperature is going down. And when here 
the fiber is cold enough, you apply the coating, and then you protect the glass with this uh, polymer layer. So glass plus coating, and especially for the long bands, we have those two effects that I will detail now further, the macro banding effect and the micro banding effect that really can, can, can impact the transmission in the upper bands. What is macro banding? Macro banding is, is really basically when, when you have an event, and, and here the event size is typically centimeter or millimeters, you bend a fiber here, you bend a fiber, and due to this, some light can escape, not be guided anymore. So this creates obviously some loss because the, the light is lost. And especially over the years when a straight line was less uh, the, the, the deployment conditions because getting closer and closer to the end users, you need to, to go around corners, pathways. So not the straight line of long distance anymore. We, we had to deal with uh, those events. Then another one, which we call the micro banding with an I. Uh, the scale here is more microscopic. This is basically the optical fiber inside the cable that can be in touch with very small events like touching some impurities or differences um, for, for cable material or even in such very dense designs uh, where you have so many fibers packed inside one module but then the fiber can touch neighboring fibers and then this create this fa famous sorry micro banding and I'll come back to it because this is pretty well known now and very much standardized and especially when there is a spec for a fiber, we put some values for macro banding. We say we want this to be that many fractions of a dB on a given uh, size. Micro banding, there is no standard. You cannot put a spec, you cannot put a value, and I'll explain you why. So, a question here is also um, macro and micro, are they kind of related in a fiber? Um, if I'm straight line, but I have very compact designs with many fibers to touching it, each other, should I use band insensitive fibers, G657, or just regular fiber? Because as it is straight, I don't need band properties. Yes, but as you need resilience to some effects in the glass, in the, in the, um, in the cable, you will see that macro and micro are both related, and you need to optimize them both for proper resilience, even if you're not deploying your cables inside with corners and very tight bands. <coughs> the standards that are existing for macro uh, are really have been, initially the standard fiber, the G652, has been designed and specified for bands down to 30 millimeters of radius. Okay, so loops of 30 millimeters of, of uh, radius. Then those three categories of band insensitive fibers had been created in the past, A1, A2, B3, uh, each one with a different band radius capability. I mean 10 millimeters, 7.55, and really trying to answer the challenges of indoor and, and access environment. But then another case has been to put as many fibers as, as we can, and we'll come back to it afterwards when talking about uh, flex tubes, when talking about mini cables, when talking about high density fiber cables. Many, many, many fibers inside some tight modules uh, just to be able to pack so many fibers in such a, a very, very small space. Then micro, micro banding really entered into the play. How can you optimize this micro banding? Again, Remember the way we make fiber, there are two variables. You can optimize the glass, optimize the coating. Optimizing the glass, we can do it alone because as Prismian, we manufacture the glass. So we master all the recipes for that and we can design and invent new ways of optimizing the glass. Optimizing the coating 
it's different because we need to work with coating experts, chemistry companies, and you need to be very powerful like Prismin is uh, to be able to work with them and have them develop specific coatings for you not off the shelf that they will propose in volume and you cannot fine tune. So that's why due to the size of Prismian, we, we, we draw so many fiber kilometers that when we talk to a coating company, they listen to us and they are ready to, ready to take our recipes or suggestion to improve their coating. And that's what we did with them. It's a long process changing a coating chemistry. We've been doing that for, for, for years and years, decades even. Uh, typically here, the coating consists of two layers. You have here a primary layer, which is basically a very soft layer, like a cushion, just amortizing uh, the effect so the glass is not stressed. And outside, there is a second layer, which is very strong, very hard, and really making the the, the, the separation with the external world, the external stresses. And by the way, this second layer, we have the capability to make it colored. That is to say, for fiber identification, we just have the color embedded in this coating, so it doesn't strip off when you clean or, or when you, 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 you remove the, the buffer material. And Optimizing the combination of both because saying I need a soft inner and a hard uh, outer material, okay, you've said it, but then you need to put some values and figure out what is soft and what is hard because if it is too soft, it doesn't do anything. If it is too hard for this, still stresses the internal side because the dimensions are very, very small. Here, we are talking about 250 micron in total, which is very, very thin. So your material really needs to be optimized. Here, we have a, uh, a view of what microbanding is in terms of dBs of loss. So the more you have, the, the worse it is. So dBs of loss, maximum, average, minimum, and for different temperatures also. Normal room temperature, minus 40, minus 60 just because also the colder you get, the more stressed uh, the fiber gets. For the regular coatings, regular is what you can find off the shelf, and many manufacturers are using those coatings, pretty standard. And for our optimized uh, uh, coatings, optimized prim primary layer and secondary layer, you have the max, average, mean, and you see the performance, the resilience, and even at low temperatures, it's working very, very well. Another way of seeing this is now I combine this coating that I've developed with the glass optimizations that we have also conducted in parallel. So you see, this is the regular performance of a G652, the single mode that is much used all over the place. The wavelength here, the attenuation, the loss due to this microbanding effect for regular fiber and for a band insensitive fiber that we use, the A2 fiber, we name it the band bright excess. Some of you might uh, already know it. Uh, we put a trench and you see the performance of it. Already optimizing the glass, I can get uh, the performance much, much, much better. And coupling that better glass with the optimized coating, I'm getting here. So you see, this blue line, which is just, I mean, uh, you don't eliminate the sensitivity because zero uh, in physics, uh, there is no zero. Huh? It uh, can always detect something. So, but it's getting very, very close, at least has improved dramatically compared to a regular fiber. And still, our duty has been to do this on the basis of any uh, uh, property characteristics of the regular fiber. That is to say, you take everything, dispersion, PMD, um, uh, OH peak, everything that a regular fiber is having, and you just encapsulate this in a band insensitive glass to protect even further the performances in any environment. That's what we've done here. 
and we conducted some comparative uh, studies with, I don't name them, but tier one providers. You can come and talk to me afterwards. I will tell you which curve is who. <laughs> so uh, basically, we, we really conducted some, um, and, and those are latest generation fibers, not fibers uh, made 10 years ago. Really the latest generations. This is the microbanding performance for this uh, tier one competitor, this tier one, and you see already applying our super coating, this is our regular fiber, so already much better. And then applying both the super duper glass, I mean the band optimized glass plus uh, the coating, this is where we are. And this for a regular fiber, I mean uh, the amount of coating that protects is summing up to 250 microns. In some cases, the, the, the cable design is not aggressive. I mean, the fiber is having a lot of space, is not uh, submitting to, to any stress. So in some cases, the design is already working with this. So why would you need this? In, some, in these cases, where the design was not that stringent, we even thought to decrease the protective size. I mean, if it's working fantastic with 250, make it smaller. And making it smaller, you can even think about more uh, compact, denser uh, cable designs. That's exactly what we did here. And this was created six years ago. Uh, basically, we started with those uh, much performing fibers. We decreased the coating size, so instead of 250, you make it 200, so less amount of material to protect. And still, this fiber is performing the same way as a regular G652 from competition. That is to say, a 652 250 is delivering the same performance as this fiber with band insensitive glass and super coating but smaller size. And using this, we were able to, uh, I'll come back to it, to really put in, 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 in configurations that were not possible before. Again, what Richard said at the very beginning, we start with the fiber, and then having fibers that are more forgiving really can open up the door to cable designs and solution designs, even connectivity, that were not possible before, just because the fiber uh, gives you extra margins to play with and to be innovative. So again, if you have to take one thing out of all this presentation is microbanding. Because microbanding, you will not see it in any standard. I mean, there are standards to measure the microbanding, like uh, expandable drums or, or, or drums with sandpaper uh, with a given granularity. The standards tell you how to measure, emulate the microbanding effect. But the standards are not telling you which value you should put in a spec. Just because uh, this at the, at the moment is not known because anyone is having their own uh, recipe for uh, the coating material, the primary layer, the secondary layer. And I showed you the comparison. We are really at the top of the performance. So I would say we've created with our new fiber kind of a de facto standard. It is not an international standard existing, but it's creating a performance standard. And this performance standard, the others are trying now to keep up by proposing band insensitive glass also. Uh, and, and more optimized coating, but we are way ahead. So what can we do with this? First, here uh, you will have a chart just explaining uh, w w the chronology of standards and what is the latest standard in force. Um, and here, uh, this band insensitive standard was created in 2006 and three versions have been made since. The latest one dating back 2012, incorporating the different grades of fibers. But if you would be to really get only one grade, get this one, G657A2, which is really the grade that we are talking about here. Uh, 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 much band insensitive glass, but protecting all the, preserving all the characteristics of a G652, and available in, in different coating sizes. 
Um, so obvious advantage, of course, of this glass. It's been developed initially because, to be honest, uh, we didn't know initially that uh, um, op optimizing macro banding would optimize directly the micro banding also. We didn't know that. For instance, in multi-mode fiber, this is not the case. Multi-mode fiber, when you create band insensitive multi-mode, uh, the micro banding is not much, much improved. But a side consequence, initially we developed those band insensitive really to keep up with bands and corners. And micro banding was not even in the scope. And it's really the side effect of it that, that we, we, we discovered the micro banding was just performing uh, extremely well. So you will see Verticasa this afternoon or Retractanet, all the, 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 the systems we are proposing for deployments are leveraging these uh, extra performances. You see uh, here with a regular fiber, you lose 11 dBs when you coil like this, and you lose almost zero uh, with the band insensitive glass. So this is obvious. You can really make things uh, in, in, in indoor environments that were not possible before. Another one that is quite interesting and it is a, a side effect, a consequence. When you bend the fiber and some, f some power is exiting or exits uh, the core, means that you have some uh, energy loss. I mean, uh, light uh, really contains energy. Uh, and, and then if this is leaking out, it's going somewhere. And the first thing it will, it will hit is the coating material, the, the, the polymer we are putting around. And in some cases, some operators got very, very nervous, and this is uh, coming from British Telecom. We had some key partnership with them in 2004. They were very nervous that in central offices, you know, where you have your high power lasers for WDM systems, for Raman pumps, even for radio over frequency equipment that are very sensitive to noise, so you need to have a lot of power inside the fibers. They were very nervous that due to the bands, the power would be going out hitting the coating and destroying the stuff. And we performed some kind of extreme uh, uh, experiments. You have one here. It's a small movie, you will see. So basically, we put 1 dot watt, 1 dot watt uh, uh, power inside the fiber core. And you see what's happening in the band. Some light just exits. And you see the sparkle here, sparkle hitting the coating. And boom, just because. Um, the coating is so much stressed, really going beyond the safety temperature. Typically, the, t the safety temperature is known to be around 85 degrees Celsius for regular uh, coating material. So going beyond, the coating just puts so much stress on the glass that the glass can break. OK, I'm not telling that any fiber in a central office will undergo this, huh? because 1.5 watt I is a lot. Huh? Uh, but uh, not, that, uh, not that much, because for instance, ramen pumps for long distance 100 gig, they are now summing up to close to one watt. So we are not that far away from having those powers available. And we really conducted a study like at what band and for what amount of power um, uh, I, 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 am I going to, to have a risk with my fibers. And we really published a full study on that, if you're interested. Please send me an email. I can forward it to you. It's been published as a technical report in the IEC and really contains some conclusions. And obviously, the conclusion is with band insensitive glass, you're safe. Because band insensitive glass keeps the, fa the power in the core. Nothing is leaking out. So you're totally safe. And that's, for that reason, many, many uh, operators are considering switching 100% of their patch cords, I mean, all the patching of, data, of, uh, of um, uh, central offices with that kind of band insensitive glass to be safe. Power is kept in the core, no incident, no problems. Another one is due to the, the fact the fiber is more uh, forgiving, you will see a full session on what we call Retractanet, where we were able to apply some very specific uh, buffer materials, uh, tube materials, to be able to retract the fibers and invent innovative solutions. Alessandro will tell you everything on that. But keep in mind, band insensitive fiber is inside this solution. And, and that's really, that's been the enabler for those uh, very innovative solutions. Uh, another one. 
is those uh, compactness. Uh, you might know that in some cases, this is the case uh, in Australia, but in many, many countries, uh, when you want to put a cable in any kind of right of way, being, uh, be it a sewer, be it a duct, you need to pay a right of way, and, and, and most of the time related to the, 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 the section, the cross section of the cable. So to, to decrease that and be able to basically put many, many fibers and, and leverage the space you occupy by putting many fibers, um, we've been able to use the bending sensitive and even the 200 micron in up to here 720 fibers in, 16, in 17 uh, millimeter here. And even in, 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 in development, we had some uh, nano designs that we've been uh, uh, testing. Uh, putting so many fibers here in a, in a space, in, in a smaller space, means instead of putting one cable here, you are, uh, you are able here to place three cables with the same uh, duct spacing, and maybe here four. Uh, mobile. Uh, uh, in, in the afternoon, I'll, I'll drive you through uh, the latest evolutions in mobile, and you will see that there are some designs here with extremely, just to be able to power uh, from remote, uh, from the base station to power the remote radio heads, some designs with extremely big conductors coexisting with uh, very teeny optical fibers, very small. So you need to, the fiber needs to be forgiving. And, and you will see that uh, we, are, we were able to make uh, designs that are very, very aggressive in terms of hybrid. Uh, and by the way, most of the fibers now going in what we call the, the front hall, uh, these uh, feeder cables are bend intensity fibers just because they are forgiving. Um, conclusions. Here is a view of the fiber consumption over the, over the years. Uh, prior to, before 2000, uh, it was really the, the long haul, long distance that was consuming a lot of fiber here in green. So definitely at that time, and, 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 and the, the, the size was not really a problem at that moment. So the, problem, the problems were totally different. They were about transmitting properly, having the right dispersion, the right nonlinear effects, totally different problems. And then started here in, in red, uh, the deployments of access networks being fixed access, fiber to the home, or even mobile access here, a part of the violet, um, the violet uh, here. Uh, I'll detail that later. And so for these access networks, really different challenges, compactness, handleability came into the play. And that's how we developed and, uh, and really standardized these band insensitive fibers. And you see here, basically, OK, ignore the yellow and the, um, and the blue separation, because basically both correspond to regular fiber, G652. So you see that the amount of G652 regular fiber that's been deployed is close to 95, 99% even now. So any innovation, any new thing you put in the ground, you need it to be completely backwards compatible with this legacy fiber, because this is basically the, the, the whole volume of fiber is consisting of, on, on that glass. But you see this uh, small blue part here, and this has started in 2007, and we were really uh, at the forefront of it because we won the first big contracts uh, involving million kilometers of fiber. Alessandro will tell you more about that. And you see now, the amount of band insensitive that is consumed in the world is, is, is close to 7% of the overall amount of uh, 250 million annual consumption. It's a lot. And it's really because this fiber has become, in, become increasingly popular, especially in the outdoor, where, where basically you need high fiber counts and, and more distances. So that's really, you, you can really see that trend, and this trend is here to stay because this fiber is just bringing in all the advantages of legacy plus protecting it further. And inside this, with our Ben Bright Excess, uh, Prismian is, is really at the forefront. I mean, we edited the standard. In, in, the, in, in the organization, in the ITU, we are the editor, 
means uh, there is a room full of experts, and it's the duty of the editor to gather all the comments and, and write, make the standards. And we've been doing that, and basically the standard has, has been developed upon a proposal we put on the table back in 2004. We were really at the forefront for this development, and, and, and since the beginning, thanks to our production process, which is very flexible, we were able to encapsulate all the characteristics of a regular glass in a banding sensitive glass. And we've been extremely successful all over the years. Our first big project, 300,000 kilometers, started in the US. A full city, 100% made with this banding sensitive glass. And then we had several adoptions of uh, um, new projects. For instance, France uh, standardized 100% uh, the access network on banding sensitive glass. China standardized 100% of indoor access, and indoor access is a lot in China. Uh, a couple of years ago was 3 million fiber kilometer for one year of indoor access in China. 100% has been standardized on the G657A2 glass. And you see it more and more. Uh, this glass came to Australia also, New Zealand. There are many, many projects involving that banding sensitive glass. Just because the quality is excellent. So this is it um, to, 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 to a bit guide you through the latest evolutions in fibers. And now you can see how we can use this fiber for new designs. Uh, again, with this aim to protect all the potential 60 terahertz spectrum that this beautiful media uh, offers to us. Uh, some uh, a CEO of an um, of, uh, international uh, operator called uh, the, the optical fiber the buried spectrum. That's exactly it. Instead of having air spectrum, you put some spectrum in the ground, and you need your duty is to keep it usable for next generation systems, and that's exactly what we do with banding sensitive glass and optimized coating. Mm -hmm.